so much. Uh, man, it's, this is amazing. WMC Fest is just incredible. I'm, I'm blown away. We're like not even in the meat of it. Um, is, is this kind of my favorite man? Uh, it's awesome. It's a total, total honor to be up here. So, then there's lots of neat things to do. So, the fact that you're sitting up on the room is a lot. Sorry, I screamed, I screamed last night. Lots of, lots of stuff in there. Um, I don't know how to just keep it. I made some notes, I had some things to say. <laughs> oh, you know what? I don't think I have notes for that slide. That's what's going on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Nate Gutesh. Uh, <laughs> I live in Northeast Indiana. Uh, I work at a design shop above a gallery in Fort Wayne called One Lucky Guitar. Um, I was hired there about six years ago. I was the first art director that they hired. Um, There's like three people on the team who have since grown to like a ten man, ten man and woman design shop. Uh, we call ourselves a design and marketing boutique because we're afraid to admit that we're now an ad agency, but that's essentially what's going on. Um, but I couldn't be happier with it. Um, in the back room at One Lucky Guitar for the last couple of years I've been publishing an art and fiction journal called Ferocious Quarterly. Um, and I basically what I want to talk about is this really long-winded story about my work and my story, how Ferocious came to be. Um, man, I'm sorry, I really was screaming a lot last night. It was intense. Um, if we're lucky, it'll be under 30 minutes, and you'll all still be awake. But we'll see how it goes. Uh, I thought to to kick things off, I'd give you a little presentation about who I am, things I like, and just like real surface level things. You can kind of get to know me better, make this easier. For instance, I'm a cat person. Um, I'm not a coffee person. I'm definitely a Paul McCartney person. <laughs> I think that Lindsey Buckingham is an unbelievable, beautiful human being. I've never heard a song that he's written that I didn't love, unless it was sung by that person. <laughs> um, this is the chronological catalog of album covers of everything Genesis and Phil Collins have put out. And I just want to tell you now, sometimes when I get a little excited or tipsy or try to impress people, I tell them that I love Genesis. I love everything they've done, but while I'm sober, that's all I own by Genesis. <laughs> that's all I just to listening to. Uh, so tonight, if we're hanging out and I'm talking about Duke and how misunderstanding is so good, it is, is a lie. I'm lying to impress you. <laughs> that's, that's all that's worth listening to by Genesis and Phil Collins. Um, I came across a quote recently that I kind of wanted to bookend this with, and it is, you can't be anything you want to be, only more of who you are. And when I first read it, it like really impacted me positively, like, man, if I would have lived a life where parents didn't say, yeah, you can be anything you want to be, if you put your mind to it, you can do anything, you can be anything, like, what would my life have looked like if I only pursued what my strengths really were, or where I should have been headed? Um, I have some different thoughts about it now, but I just want to kind of open with that because it's been on my mind. Um, and yeah, I read somewhere they get open with quotes. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, like a lot of people in this room, and designers and illustrators, I, I spent my whole life, my whole childhood, drawing. Um, and that really meant getting comics and mimicking art styles. Uh, my mom was a commercial artist and was really encouraged to kind of develop my own style. And as I got older, comics kind of worked their way backwards and I really became a fan of like Silver Age comics in the 50s and 60s and Jack Kirby has been a huge hero of mine my, my whole life. Um, his work is just incredible. I've been studying him and collecting his work for maybe 15 years. It's impossible I think not to see this and at least a little bit want to be a comic book artist when you grow up even now. Um, man, it's just remarkable. And then something happened in my adolescence and I was completely distracted from wanting to be an illustrator and wanting to be a comic book artist, and that was punk rock. <laughs> from the moment I heard it, I wanted nothing to do in my life but to sing in a punk band or play guitar in a punk band. Uh, from like 1996 to 2006, I was in 12 bands, punk and metal, and just wanted to be loud, and didn't give a damn about visual arts anymore. Um, as years have gone on, I've kind of gotten a little bit pussy about music I like. Right now I'm in a kind of a artsy, bullshit, instrumental, electronic situation. <laughs> um, 
Minivari is just a little blip on the map, really, but um, I feel like I've been in the band my whole life, and I, I've never been so proud of being part of anything than this band of Minivari. Um, in the context of my life, the adventures that we've been on, the tours have just been unbelievable. The people we've met, I'm, I'm not getting choked up, it's the, uh, the throat speech. <laughs> just met some incredible people. We got to showcase at South by Southwest a couple years ago, and it was life changing. The photo in the bottom right, we got to play with our local Philharmonic in our hometown. They wrote material to go with some of our work, and it was just amazing. But it's been unbelievable, and I feel like the biggest life lesson I've learned from being in bands and in Minivari specifically is that collaboration is compromising. It's, it's selfish, but it's easy to share things you love and that you've done with people, but to share an actual creation, to share in that process, is, it really takes a lot out of you. It takes a gentle heart and a willingness to give yourself over to share in the creation. And uh, Minivari has taught me that, because that's, that's really what it is. I've been a, a songwriter a lot of my life and I'm writing music with people I love and having to give up ideas and, and sacrifice things to, to make music that we can love together, not just music by Nate, um, and it's great. Um, but something that I've learned over the years about being in a band that's more important than whether or not I know how to play an instrument or the kind of music we're playing is swag. Um, especially <laughs> always being the artist in all the bands I was in have created the art and the swag for, for every band I've been in. Um, so I thought I'd show you some stuff that I've done the last couple years in Medivari. I'll spare you the 90s tape cassette inserts I made for the punk bands I was in. Um, this, this was a, our debut kind of full-length album. It's called Be One of Us and Hear No Noise. Um, we met a man online that had visited Easter Island when he was little and had all these amazing pictures of his childhood. He's German and their travels there. And uh, we found out that if you swap some letters in Medivari, it spells Mataveri, and it's an emergency landing strip for U.S. space shuttles on Easter Island. So we decided to center this album around that and use photographs from his childhood and kind of this uh, uh, short little package. And the, and the songs are all instrumental, but they're kind of the story of this man traveling over several oceans and getting lost on Easter Island. So each uh, CD gets a different photograph. And, we actually sold out of the disc that had photographs in them. Um, but that, that was our, our first disc. And then that, we ended up getting signed to a label in Japan called Friend of Mine. They re-released Be One of Us and Hear No Noise as an extended edition with a couple more tracks. And got to do this weird thing called a Moby Strip, which is a bunch of Japanese writing on it. And it looks amazing. And for a bunch of guys in Indiana that I haven't seen in Japan, it's just life changing. Um, they, uh, they attached this little booklet, uh, or a little folded piece of paper, and then had an interview with us about the song. Since they were in instrumental, they wanted us to explain what they meant. This is kind of funny, so this weird piece of paper that gets packaged with the Japanese edition is hilarious. So, as, as time went on, um, I ended up staying at home. I didn't go off to college. I went to school in my hometown because I thought that eventually the band would take me out of Indiana, take me out of Fort Wayne. I um, ended up getting a job at an ad agency and worked there for about four years before getting scooped up by one monkey, one monkey guitar, excuse me. Um, and it's been, it's been great, as I said, like, we've just been really lucky to land some, some big work and grow. Um, something about one monkey guitar that's just been amazing is their love for the city, for Fort Wayne. Um, been a part of a lot of events, a lot of uh, curation and things going on in downtown Fort Wayne specifically. We work downtown at an art gallery, and it kind of sparked this desire to, to want to network and be around people who make art. And um, a few years after I started working on Lucky Guitar, I started a gallery with some friends of mine called Soma. And it was an old, uh, rundown tattoo parlor in the outskirts of downtown, in kind of a uh, shifty neighborhood. And we spent a summer uh, mopping it out, cleaning, horrible things out of the back and kind of dividing it into studios and had a gallery up front. Um, and then I, I became kind of a, the guy that really sent out the emails and, and tried to meet people online and, and commission work for the space. And every month we commit to doing a show and host these shows in front of the gallery. And it, again, in my mind, it was like this awesome couple of years that it existed and there's, it was always packed and the art was always incredible. And, Sometimes it was all local, sometimes it was regional, and it really uh, sparked something inside me to want to get back into illustrations. At the time, I was like in this agency life, and I really wanted to do what I thought I was going to do forever when I was a kid, and that was to draw 
So I, I kind of put up a website and started getting more involved with things that were happening online and outside of Fort Wayne and trying to like make a name for myself as an illustrator, not just you know cooped up in, in agency life. So I thought I'd run through some stuff that I've done over the years, kind of side projects and things. And this is really just a look at me, look at me, look at me, but uh, it shows <laughs> um, This was a piece that I did for Dan Casaro's 1550 project. Uh, Bobby Solomon's wallpaper project for the Fox is Black. He wanted something winter themed. Uh, I'm a year-round bike commuter, so at the time it was like really brutal winter. Just do that. Uh, Evan Strumke's um, momentous project. This was centered around uh, the Wright Brothers. Uh, this was the Silver Screen Society. He got assigned to do a drawing around the third man. It's like a 1949 British film starring Orson Welles. And, um, I watched the movie for the first time, and it was it was a great movie and lots of like twists and turns, and it was a thriller. But the music in the movie was nuts. It it was all on a zither, and that was the only instrument in the entire movie. It was so strange. So I did a portrait of Anton Karras, who did the score with like some uh, cityscapes from the movie, like kind of coming out of his zither. Um, this was for a show called Star Wars vs. Dinosaurs. <laughs> um, oh, this was Joe Van Wiedering and Paula Davis's What If show in Chicago. I, it takes a long time to explain this, but the, the gist of it was um, create a piece that suggests an alternate universe based on a what if statement. So my universe is, what if Jimmy Foster never existed? <laughs> That's an example. If you follow that sundial around, it takes you through this wormhole of things that really truly almost happened in our life. For instance, Carrie Fisher auditioned for Jodie Foster's part in Taxi Driver and didn't get it. So I'm, I'm suggesting if she didn't exist, Carrie Fisher would have gotten it, and it would have led to all these insane things and basically a wormhole in time where she could have never possibly existed. And it's, it's really unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was AIGA Colorado's Bordeaux Bello event. Um, really honored to be a part of that. And I ended up getting a really nice email from the woman who ended up buying my piece and like a photograph of it hanging in her house. It's incredible. Uh, the Half and Half's Occupy Poster Project, Jim LaPay's and Troy Deshano's Old and New Project. So a couple years went by, SOMA finally kind of fell apart. People left, wanted to do other things. Some of the guys were still in school at the time, so they moved out of Indiana when, when they graduated, and uh, SOMA went back to being a dirty hole in Fort Wayne. But it left a hole in my heart. Uh, that, that act of curation and meeting people that were so much better than you and being inspired by artists and people around you and curating that gallery really left me wanting to do more of that, but, but maybe not in a gallery because it um, was a lot of time and, and cleaning. Um, so at One Lucky Guitar, I kind of pitched to the team, what if we kind of hosted a blog and it gathered artists and we could say, hey, would you do a piece for us for this blog based on X situation and we'll throw it up there, maybe have a writer give a story and I'll go on the blog with it and we'll call it Rectangle and it'll be awesome, the tagline, art is a conversation. And I worked on the front end development, got about halfway through and then it just dawned on me like, man, this is nothing new, like there's so many blogs on the internet collecting awesome art, um, it's a drop in the bucket and it's not even going to be as good as that, let's, let's not do that. So uh, I, I took a year and a half off and saved up load of money and decided what I'm going to attempt to do is publish a journal that is essentially what I wanted to do in the blog and have artists and writers work together and be in these little books and see if people want to buy them. Uh, a couple friends of mine hopped on board immediately, Matt Beers, Jason Raymer, and Scott Kirkpatrick, and the four of us have kind of been working this since 2010, um, sent out emails to hundreds of people from my peers, who I knew would say yes and were awesome, to my heroes, who I knew would say no and did say no. And somehow, like, over the months of curating, we ended up having a book of uh, almost 100 pages, uh, I think 44 artists in full. And this one might have been 56 artists, but just jam-packed with incredible work, absolutely incredible work. I'm just blown away by the time. I mean, we're asking people to just basically do some free work for us for no reason, and then we might sell some and you might never hear from us again. And they did it, they all did it, and they put their heart and soul into it, and they got a lot of 
the press, like right at the gates, grain it, posted about it, and for a friend only, did a little write up about it, and started getting uh, calls for interviews and things. And it's like, man, this this is really gonna work out. So, with the money that we were making and the rest that we had saved, we ended up doing uh, a second issue, double issue called Purple Halves. Um, and this one had 44 contributors in all. Um, again, we had a uh, writer and artist collaborations in the back where we'd send, we'd get a story from a writer and send it to an illustrator and say, do your piece based on the story, um, however you want, you have a spread to work with, and here are the colors. And one book is blue, one book is red, that's where Purple Hives come from. Um, and then uh, it kind of ignited, we, we got, sorry, for about a month, I think, 100 emails a week asking if they could be a part of it. Um, from in incredible human beings who I admire to college students who were just thirsty to get involved in something that, that they thought was great and just, just could not keep up with the amount of submissions that were coming in. Um, but then the sales kind of trickled until it, it stopped and uh, issue three looked like it couldn't happen as soon as we wanted to. So like, man, we're still, we're, we're still getting press. People are still liking this. Um, we have a lot of submissions, not a lot of sales. What if we did this thing called Kickstarter that people do where they raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and felt like people we were kind of maybe brushing shoulders with were doing that and making shitloads of money. It's like, we'll do it, we'll be rich, we can use the rest to buy cars and stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, we launched this Kickstarter uh, and it totally failed. <laughs> uh, we asked for a, a lot more than a, a normal issue was costing, thinking that Again, we're just naive to what would actually happen on Kickstarter. Maybe it'll be hardback, maybe it'll be a belly band, and it's going to be embossed, and it's going to be amazing. And of course, we'll make the money. T totally didn't make the money. I mean, we were selling it hundreds of issues at this point, and only 61 people even backed it. And it, it just really took the wind out of our sails. So we took basically a year to get back on our feet and get the other issues paid off based on sales and um, get ready for issue three during that process. Um, Myself being in a band, and Scott Kirkpatrick, who's on the Ferocious team, is also in a band. So we started taking books with us on tour um, to see if comic book shops or small local independent bookstores would want to carry it. And nine places in kind of this half of the country started carrying it and still do to this day, which is awesome. And sales started coming in a lot faster at that point. And then I had an idea last year at the end of um, the U.S. Space Shuttle program. What if I did kind of these? Um, put five posters based on the five U.S. space shuttles. And I would do these kind of inky illustrations of astronauts from those particular shuttles and like lots of little icons and things representing the individual flights and little staffs. And, um, I got about three in and it was taking so much time that I decided to put the brakes on and see if people would actually want to buy this. And it, it did sell a lot, thankfully, in the first couple months we really raised a lot of money for Ferocious through these, but then it kind of trickled off before I decided it probably wouldn't be worth it to do the other two shows, so that's on hold, but we've got three of them. I couldn't be happier with how it, how it turned out. A good friend of mine, Sean Molinowski from Fort Wayne, is a print shop and printed all these for me. Um, they're, I have them here at the gallery if you want to see them. They're really ridiculous. It took, it took way too much time and it to, I think, mainly because I thought I would do a line drawing representing each patch for every single flight, and then it dawned me that means like hundreds of patches being interpreted into line work. And it's just silly, but um, I'm really, really happy with how they came out. I, I wish I was more motivated to do the other two, but for now we didn't. Um, but finally raised the money and got to a place a year later. I wasn't even sure if people knew what Ferocious was anymore at that point. Uh, so we felt like we had disappeared for so long, but, but sales were consistent and decided to fire the guns on the third issue. Um, we called it Be Prepared, and the theme was survival. We hit up a bunch of folks this time in tons of people to choose from and friends we had made over that year um, that we thought would say yes this time. We got a lot less in those, which was awesome. Um, and we did a third issue. And uh, we launched a little uh, teaser video when it was on press to kind of like peak interest and see if people, if people know who we are anymore. So those, those 61 people who backed us <laughs> still like us. Uh, and in 24 hours, 5,000 people watched the video and passed it around. And, um, it's unbelievably encouraging. No, there's, oh, there's an audio on this video. How do I do that? Uh, oh, this. <laughs> this is, it's good. Yeah, it's, 
Make sure you turn your speaker off. Sorry. Sean Malinowski is an incredible talent in Fort Wayne, and he and I are 
going to do something called Field Club that I'll just briefly get into. Basically, we're collecting teams of artists to redesign vintage logos from U.S. sports teams, and then we're going to pin them up against each other, and there'll be like little competitions and things, and then you can buy the prints and shirts of these like, reworked logos. It's called FieldClub.us. Um, I wish to show you more, but the busy times. Um, also, my my girlfriend last year. She's really nice. She like she likes to do that. <laughs> and brunch. She's really into brunch. Um, she bought a, that thing. Um, this idea to make a cupcake truck out of it with her good friend, who's wife of the drummer and Metafari. Um which is awesome. So they wanted to name it Beep Beep Baby Cakes. I got to do the branding and some icons and a website for it. Um, we started saving up money, found a mechanic that would restore it. It didn't run the, the engine. You could literally put your hand through the engine. It was so rusted, but it's beautiful. Um, and it, it's way too expensive. It, it, you could build this thing out of like glass and gold, and it would be cheaper than what it's taking. To <laughs> so, beep Beep Baby Cakes may never happen, but there's, there's the slide that we at least thought about it at one point. Um, I don't know if I mentioned them in a band or not. That, actually, that music was, was Men of Army, so that's different to your um, We had an idea to try this Kickstarter thing as well, but only a fraction of the cost that Ferocious asked, and it was successful. And uh, we're working on our second album right now. It's called Gravity is Still Everywhere. Um, we're actually playing tomorrow at 5 o'clock in Saigon Plaza. Um, we're going to be, we're going to play nothing off of Gravity is Still Everywhere. We haven't played it yet, so um, we rehearsed all week. We're going to play about 20 minutes off the new record tomorrow. And, uh, the guy jumping, Kyle, couldn't make it because his wife is probably pushing a child out of her vagina as we speak. <laughs> so back to this quote. You, you can't be anything you want to be, only more of who you are. I think it's bullshit. Um, I think that if you don't at least think anything is possible, you're never going to try anything. So, so no one really knows what we're all individually capable of unless we just try them. Uh, I think we have to prove those kinds of things to ourselves. Um, being a little dramatic, I wish I had like, some moody music to go along. But I, I just want to close by saying I, I really hope we can come away from this weekend with just an overwhelming desire to create. To create because it's who we are and to create because it's who we want to be. Um, I hope we participate in things. I hope we can create something that um, people can participate in and also participate in things that move us to create. Um, there are so many amazing designers right now that sites like Dribble expose that the world is just dripping wet with awesome design and illustrators. Um, if you are someone that is curating and is looking for that unplucked talent, pluck the unpluck. Um, and if you are that unplucked talent, be relentless. Make more work than you've ever made in your life and get it everywhere. Um, there's so many vehicles to do that, and I, I feel so lucky through Ferocious to be able to have met what I would consider unplucked and cream of the crop, and their work is both incredible. So coming back to that quote, um, we can only be more of who we are. However that is, however we are more of who we are, I hope we can be more of who we are together all at once. Thank you very much. Saigon Plaza, if you want to talk to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Seriously, thank you.